Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is titled The Effect of Mental Demand on Leg Loading in Highly Dynamic Motion. My name is Christopher Iverson from Anybody Technology and I will be the host of today's webinar. Today I am here together with my colleague Bjorn Geller, who is also an R&D engineer here at Anybody Technology. So today we have an external speaker who is Simon Auer, who is a PhD student and research assistant at the Laboratory for Biomechanics at the OTH Regensburg. Simon is going to give his presentation in a minute or so, but just before we start, I will give a general introduction to the Anybody Modeling System. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the software or musculoskeletal modeling in general. But what is the Anybody Modeling System? So the antibody modeling system is a software that allows you to do musculoskeletal modeling. As input, it takes motion data as kinematics and forces, and it calculates the internal body loads as joint moments, joint reaction forces, and muscle forces. And here in the bottom of the screen, you can see a screenshot from the antibody modeling software. So this is how it actually looks. At the moment, antibody is used in a wide variety of areas and applications. And a few examples of this is movement analysis, product optimization design, the field of sports, orthopedics and rehabilitation, and assistive devices. And the typical workflow in anybody could look something like this. So you provide the motion data as input and use the body models which you or others have built. And then you provide some kind of environment which could be, for example, an exoskeleton. And then you can use anybody to combine these things and run inverse dynamics simulations to calculate the internal body loads. You can then output the results and use it for post-processing with, for example, some kind of finite element tool. But many users also closes the loop completely by doing some kind of design optimization and run this cycle multiple times. And this brings me to the end of the introduction. And I will hand over the presenter role to Simon Auer instead. Wonderful. So hello to everybody from me as well. And thank you, Christopher, for your nice introduction. My name is Simon Auer and I'm with the Laboratory for Biomechanics at the OTH in Regensburg. And I have the pleasure to present you our work on the effect of mental stress on the musculoskeletal loading in highly dynamic motion. The webcast will mainly treat two studies we conducted in our lab dealing with amateur and elite junior football players. But there will also be a small excursion on our previous studies on stress. And before I start with the presentation, I would like to thank my colleagues, you saw the names just before, who made all a valuable contribution to the preparation, execution and evaluation of the studies. So first of all, I would like to talk about the definition of stress. There are numerous ones, uh, they range from biology to mechanics, nevertheless, what we're dealing with is psychological stress. It's a feeling of emotional strain and pressure. At least that's what Wikipedia says. And it can occur in the form of occupational stress, major life events, or daily hassles. It can also appear in special situations, for example, in sports events. There are external factors such as fans and their cheering and catcalling or internal game-related factors importance of the game, motivational aspects, or special game situations with tackling, tactics, or deflection. The effects of this kind of mental stress on the body have been studied in the past. Arithmetic tasks as mental stress have been used. Others used short-term memory tasks, negative, unsupported language, or an additional cognitive task. These various studies found that under stress, muscle activity in the upper extremities and back increases significantly. Furthermore, muscles were active even though there was no physical necessity for this. And in addition to an increased muscle tone, an increase in compression and lateral shear forces in the spine was also observed. While these studies consistently detect an increased biomechanical loading under mental stress, some information is still missing. The aforementioned studies all deal with quasi-static or low dynamic motion since they arise from the field of workplace ergonomics. In our lab, we have also conducted studies in order to investigate the influence of stress on biomechanical loading, especially on the effects of the whole back musculature. 
For this purpose, subjects were equipped with electromyography on the back, the EMG, and had to sit or perform defined flexion or extension tasks under stress. The study used arithmetical tasks and emotional stressors, and it found an increased muscle tone in the upper back for all stressors. The arithmetical tasks or the arithmetical task also showed an increase in the lower back. These increased muscle tones were fed into the musculoskeletal simulation and were compared with and without increased muscle tone. The higher muscle tone led to an increase of spine forces by 25% body weight and average in the cervical spine and in the lumbar spine by 19% body weight. Nevertheless, the peak increases were 123% body weight in the cervical and 69% body weight in the lumbar spine. When investigating the dynamic condition of flexion and extension, it could be found that the movement patterns change as well as the muscle recruitment in the back. And this is where we get to the highly dynamic motion. In our case, it's football, as it's in American English, it's soccer. Despite its popularity, football bears a considerable injury risk. And injuries to the muscles of the thigh are common in amateur and professional football. They represent almost a third of all injuries. They can lead to costs associated with treatment, as well as those associated with long-term recovery and absence from training and competition, or even work. Further, there is a high risk of subsequent injury or injury reoccurrence. These injuries occur primarily from overuse and in non-contact situations, and half of them occur during matches, which involve a high physical workload combined with psychological pressure in the form of cognitive anxiety and changed mood states. In the past, psychological factors have already been identified as potential injury risk factors, but not only professionals are affected. Players in semi-professional and elite junior football also have a comparably high injury risk, especially on the musculature, because these levels of competition are characterized by the same high ambitions and physical demands as, uh, of the players in professional football. So, in summary, we have occupational re research with, which has shown us that stress can lead and leads to increased biomechanical loading. In addition to that, we have footballers which have a high risk of injury to the muscles of the thigh and in connection with an increased stress level and the connection stress and injury in football, it was the aim of our studies to investigate the influence of mental stress on musculoskeletal loading in highly dynamic motion. For this purpose, we conducted two separate studies. The first study was performed with 12 elite junior football players from a second Bundesliga U17 team. They conducted change of direction maneuvers in the speed court. Don't worry, I will get to the exact methodology, methodology shortly and I will explain it to you. They did two runs, one with and without a stressor. We recorded the change of direction maneuvers in the speed court with a Viken system, so used optical motion capture as input for the musculoskeletal simulation. The second study was conducted with five male amateur football players in our lab where they had to run a distance of 50 meters for baseline and stressor. These runs were recorded with the Ixens MVN link system, so inertial motion capture was used as input for the simulation. The stressor we used was equal for both studies. In cooperation with our psychologists, we used a modified, uh, modified version of the D2 attention test, which is widely used in the field of psychology. We displayed D's and P's with one to four dashes on an additional screen, as you can see it here on the right side. The participants had to confirm every D with exactly two dashes with yes and every other combination with no. So for example here, the first one would be a yes, the second and third a no, the fourth uh, would be yes again and the others would be no. For the evaluation of the stressor, we made use of the established NASA TLX questionnaire, which uh, is an evaluation form. There, the participants have to rate the perceived physical demand, the mental demand, as well as their performance, their effort, and their frustration directly after the run. 
the scale ranges from zero, which is a low rating, to 10, which means a high rating. You let the players fill the forms directly after each run. So now let's get to the details of the speed court study. The image you can see here shows the test setup and the speed court with the motion capture system. The speed court system is a four times four meters field, the blue field here, with 12 integrated pressure plates, pressure plates which are the red ones with the white frame, and the screen in front of it. The pressure plates are connected to a computer which detects foot contacts and highlights the target field on the screen. The system has already been used in order to recreate standardized sport-related change of direction maneuvers. In our case, we designed a running route which uh, had the form of a star, so it's a so-called star run. You can see it in the video here. It's a video, a promotion video from the manufacturer from YouTube, but uh, our uh, route was very similar. The players uh, had to start in the middle field touch a randomly highlighted outer field and return to the middle, and then again a randomly uh, highlighted outer field and so on. And the screen in front only shows uh, the current target field, so they don't know what comes after the next middle field until they touch it. We measured the running times through the system, starting with the first and ending with the last foot contact on the middle field. And for the purpose of familiarization, the players were introduced to the speed crit system and the, stress, and the stressor before the runs. We investigated the kinematics in form of running time, as I already told you, from first field to last field. The musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal simulations were conducted for the contact phases of the outer fields. Uh, we defined the contact uh, phases as um, plus minus 0 0.6 seconds before and after foot to field contact when the system said there was a contact. The uh, investigated muscles were the injury prone rectus femoris muscle, vastus medialis, biceps femoris, and semitendinosus. The second study, the sprinting study, was conducted in our lab. There, the subjects ran 50 meters for baseline and stressor. The 50 meters were div uh, divided in five times 10 meter sprint with turning points. So they started, ran 10 meters, turned around, ran 10 meters, and so on. In order to apply the stressor here, screens were placed in each direction, as you can see on the bottom figure. Further on, the runs were executed on artificial turf in order to avoid sliding on the ground. Here, we investigated the running time the step length and also made an EMG analysis of the rectus femoris, vastus medialis and lateralis, biceps femoris and semitendinosus muscle. For the calculation of our models, we used the Anybody modeling system with the version 7.2 and the AMMR 2.2. The first study, the speaker study used the 2.2.0 AMMR and the second study, the 2.2.3. The first study was based on the plug-in gate example from the AMMR with a custom marker set. Therefore, we added some uh, markers uh, to the legs and to the feet in order to avoid any information loss in the highly dynamic motion. For the simulation itself, we used the quadratic muscle recruitment criterion and the ground reaction force prediction. The second study was based on the BVH example from the AMMR since the recording technique was different here. Otherwise, it was identical to the speed cut study model. Let us get to the results. Here you can see the results from the NASA TLX questionnaire on the left. The rating of each parameter is given in light gray for the baseline and in black for the stressor run. On the x-axis, it's mental demand, physical demand, time demand, performance, effort, and frustration. These results supported uh, an association with the stressor because when the runs were carried out without mental stress, they were averagely rated uh, 5.8 5 for the mental demand and therefore significantly less mentally demanding than the runs with, with stressor, which had an average rating of 8.5.
The physical demand under stress was averagely rated 6.7, while the baseline had a mean rating of 6.5, which means that the physical demand was not perceived differently. The parameters time demand, performance, effort, and frustration were not rated significantly either, or significantly different either. On the right, the figure shows the results from the runtime analysis. Regarding the kinematic, kinematics, the velocity in runs under mental stress were significantly lower than in the baseline runs. In terms of times, this means that the players ran on average 35.7 seconds in baseline, but 39.9 under mental stress. So for the baseline, as well as uh, for the mental stressor, we ran 204 simulations resulting in 408 datasets in total. Here you can see an exemplary snippet of one contact phase simulation. We took the peak muscle force you can see in the figure on the right for the rectus and the biceps femoris. So if we look here, uh, took them for the other muscles as well. But if you look um, here, we have, for example, the peak at around 30.8 for the rectus femoris and around 31.2 for the biceps femoris. The differences in mean peak muscle force as well as the percentage change were calculated between baseline and in stress condition. These, these results were averaged over all fields for one participant and muscle in order to allow an interpretation for the individual players. The table here of the admittedly big table shows the results of the musculoskeletal simulation. If we look at the muscles, we get a very heterogeneous picture. On the one hand, there are partial differences in the stress reaction between left and right. And on the other hand, there are differences between the individual muscles themselves. For example, if we look at the semitendinosus muscle on the right side, it consistently shows reduced muscle forces under stress, while it also shows increased values on the left side. The situation is comparable for the biceps femoris muscle, which has only few increased muscle forces on the right side, but more on the left. The vastus medialis responds analogously. Conversely, this means a more frequent increase in muscle force and the stress on the left side. The last investigated muscle, the rectus femoris, has changes on the left and right, which are more or less the same, which with forces with force increases being higher on the left. If you look at the subjects, we can also see that they show a different uh, behavior to the mental stressor. For example, here subjects four and eight, they have uh, a little to no effect on peak muscle force. For these players, the percentage change under stress are rather small. But if we look at subjects five and nine, uh, they show comparatively frequent high changes in muscle force uh, under mental stress. So summarized, this means while for the vastus medialis, semitendinosus and biceps femoris muscle, the force is almost exclusively reduced under stress. In the rectus femoris, there are increases and decreases to the same extent. And it can also be seen that the direction of change differs from subject to subject. In the second study, the rating of the stressor was similar to the rating in the speed code study, but with some offset. The mental demand in the baseline was rated 1.9 and 5.8 under stress. The physical demand was rated 6.8 and 7.2. Here, the figure on the left shows the mean running time and standard deviation for baseline and stressor run. In the control condition, the players ran 14.2 seconds and under stress, they ran 14.6 seconds for the 50 meters. The table here on the right displays the average maximum step length for each foot and sprint per subject over 50 meters. The step length, which is displayed here, does not yield a noticeable difference between the stress and the control conditions. They are more or less the same for each subject um, regarding baseline and stressor. The figure here shows the EMG analysis of the sprints for the different muscles and subjects. It displays the ratio between stressor and baseline in percent. 
values over 100% represent an increase in the stressor run. It also shows a heterogeneous behavior over all muscles and subjects as the simulation of the first study did already. There is no pattern to be detected. The muscles and uh, subjects all react very individually. For example, the fourth subject shows a very high fluctuations compared to the other subjects, but only in the extensor muscles. The flexor muscles are not affected in such an extent. But again, no general conclusion for flexor or extensor or for one subject can be drawn, as there are upwards and downwards fluctuations in the same quantity. So we made a speed crit study where we can see the reduced performance of the athletes best in a significantly increased running and reaction time, which raises from average actually 35.7 to 39.9 seconds under mental stress, which is an increase of about 10%. Only two players were equally fast for both runs. Nevertheless, their rating of mental demand in the NASA TLX was comparable to others. This could imply a greater tolerance to stress for some players, although the perception is the same. The other athletes needed longer for the stress runs, yet the performance drop under stress cannot be seen clearly in the peak muscle forces of the athletes. There's no consistent pattern here, there. While the average peak force level seems to remain the same under stress, despite lower velocities, there are considerable, fr considerable fluctuations in the individual parameters. But again, no general conclusion can be drawn from these deviations, but it seems to be that the left side is more sensitive to changes in peak muscle force. In further studies, the investigation of the dominant side of the players should be taken into consideration. Although there were some athletes who are more affected in the extensor muscles, rectus femoris and vastus medialis, and others in the flexor muscles, biceps femoris and semitendinosus, the low number of players does not allow an overall statement. Furthermore, the number of downward deviations is more than twice as high as the number of upward deviations. So generally, these deviations may be induced by differences in strength in the player's left and right leg. However, this remains speculative without the information on the dominant side. The second study shows a different view on the kinematics. There are running times and step length, which were equal for baseline and stressor, despite a higher rating of mental demand in the NASA TLX. This might imply that the stressor did not have the same effect as it did in the first study. This might probably be because the deflection or attention effect, uh, which uh, the stressor aims on, is not as important in a sprint, a predefined route, as it would be in a random unknown route, uh, as it would be in the speed court. Nevertheless, we can see changes in muscle activity, which vary from subject to subject and from muscle to muscle. Therefore, the effects of the stress might only be recorded via EMG, but no changes in the kinematics occurred. Since the experimental condition here is relatively new, our study, of course, is subjected to some limitations. Although we used generally established methods, they had to be adjusted to our special environment in the speed court and also to the sprinting. One aspect is the complexity of the movements. The randomization of the route in the speed court has the effect of unequal movement sequences. Thus, every time a field is approached, the heading is slightly different from the second attempt. This makes a simple comparison of the stressor and the baseline runs difficult. However, we enforced the same start and end point, the middle and the outer field for each attempt, which minimizes these deviations. And by considering the contact phases of plus minus 0 0.6 seconds to the turning point, this deviation is further minimized and a learning effect for the players is also avoided. And besides that, the speed crit system has already been utilized in sports related studies in the recent past. Its application ranges from a focus on using the speaker system to help identify factors for improving uh, performance as injury prevention or rehabilitation. For the second study, we should explicitly mention the application of the stressor. Since the stressor aims on deflection and attention, 
its kinematic effects and are predefined at known root are rather small. Yet the EMG analyze, analysis implies a physiological effect on the muscle tone. And additionally, the evaluation through questionnaire is bound to some, to some restrictions. While the collection of physiological parameters such as electrodermal activity, so-called EDA, or heart rate variability are more precise than questionnaires, they lose their validity in physically demanding activities as we had here. The inevitable sweating of the test subjects and the varying exposure makes the results of the measurements uninterpretable. Although questionnaires are always answered subjectively, especially in the investigated age group of the elite to junior football players, the results of the self-evaluation forms in combination with the increased running times of the speed court study support the reliability. Hence, the questionnaire remains a reliable alternative to the EDA tests. Another aspect of limitation is the simulation with the anybody modeling system. For this study, a quadratic target function was used for the optimization problem and for numerical stability. This algorithm is responsible for the numerical activation of the muscles and consequently their exerted force. However, it can only work with the kinematic input from the motion capture software and it lacks information on real muscle activation since the numerical muscle activation is based on an optimization algorithm. But besides that, it is commonly used for faster movement, movements and its validity for these applications has already been investigated. So as an outlook and future work, uh, we have this study now which combines established methods to expose players to a mental tasks while performing highly dynamic movements. Yet the combination of these is novel and needs further validation to yield a proper representation of in-game situations in football. One way of getting this is to test more players. Also, we have the questionnaires who, which have proven to be a practical way of assessing stress. And for the daily routine in elite to junior football, this study shows that a mental stress inducing task is associated with decreased performance and can change musculoskeletal loading patterns. But in order to record other than the kinematic effects, for example, the higher muscle tone, an EMG analysis is needed. And additionally, it might imply that the player's individual reaction stress in stress situations represent an important role to successful football play and may be considered in training planning for the season. Also, Properly managing stress may be a so far underrepresented aspect for injury prevention in football players. Future studies could therefore research into this association and develop programs to direct these stressors in order to avoid motion patterns prone to injury during football activity. And furthermore, we also should look into the human ground residuals, the so called hand of God of the musculoskeletal simulations. We experienced some issues while analyzing the sprinting studies where the residuals went up to 200% body weight when there was no ground contact. So we will and we should have a further look into this in order to minimize these forces and get reliable, more reliable results. To sum it all up, the purpose of this study was to investigate the effect of stress on the velocity and muscle forces of the athletes. To this end, 12 young competitive athletes and five amateur players were exposed to mental stress during highly dynamic movements. The mental stress task was found to be associated with a lower velocity in the speed court, but not in the sprinting task. Hence, we can state that the effect dep depends on the running task. Additionally, changes in peak muscle force were observed in the first study and changes in muscle activity in the second one. Further on, we have noticed that these effects differ from subject to subject because they all react very individually. Altogether, we can say that this is one of the first studies to quantify an association between mental stress with reduced football players' performance and changes in muscle force. And now, at the end of my presentation, I want to thank you all for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. So thank you very much for the presentation, Simon. 
And uh, just be go, before we go to the Q&A session, I would like to say a few words regarding our online resources. So if you want to know more about the Anybody Technology, you can go and check out our website at anybodytech.com, where you'll find special dates and events, and also a full publication list. You can also check out edyscript.org, and here you can find the community website for people using Anybody. There's links to the wiki page and link to our repository sites, and it's also here the forum is located if you need to, to get some help from some fellow Anybody users. I would also like to point your attention to a new webcast coming up soon. It's titled The New Features in the Anybody Modeling System, and it's presented twice on Tuesday, October 6th. And the registration link can be found on our website and also on our social media accounts, but will also be sent out through emails very soon. If you have any questions or want to meet up, please feel free to send us an email at sales at anybodytech.com. And if you yourself have created something really interesting with the Anybody Modeling System, you would like to do a presentation similar to Simon, then please feel free to send me an email at ki at anybodytech.com.